Okay. All right. So we are recording. Just always like to let everybody know that, um, that we are recording each time. So thank you everybody for joining us for today's UNC Health Media Briefing. This is our 15th since the pandemic began. Today, we'd, we're going to hear from two physician researchers at UNC Health discussing the impact of health disparities on minority groups during the COVID-19 pandemic. They'll be able to answer questions across a broad spectrum in this area, uh, including research, testing, access to care, and so forth. Full details um, on some of those areas are in the meeting invitation. We encourage you to please ask as many questions as you can, and they don't have to be in those necessarily directly in those areas either. Um, just to let you know, we will record the full briefing and then we'll post an unedited MP4 file on both Dropbox and YouTube for your use afterwards. Um, and an audio MP3 recording for radio that we can actually email to you because it's not gigantic um, after the briefing. And uh, radio outlets have used that and some people just use it as for note taking. So um, you can also record directly from Zoom as well. If you want to record from Zoom to your computer, click on the record button within the Zoom panel. And once you do that, I'll be able to authorize your recording and you'll be able to download the files yourself. Um, so please also uh, send me a chat message if you're gonna record, just so I make sure that I, um, I go in there and do the authorization and then we'll uh, be good to go. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Alan Wolf, and Alan will introduce today's guest, Alan. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled to introduce our guests. Um, Dr. Crystal Sene is an associate professor in the Division of General Medicine and Clinical Epidemiology at the UNC School of Medicine. Her research seeks to reduce disparities in health and healthcare by addressing social determinants of health. Dr. Giselle Corby Smith is a keen and distinguished professor of social medicine director of the Center of Health Equity Research and a professor of internal medicine. She's recognized for her scholarly work on the practical and ethical issues of engaging communities in research to achieve health and equality. Thank you both for joining us. I know you've got a lot of work going on these days. Dr. Sene, would you like to kick us off and just talk a little bit about some of the work you're doing? Yeah, thanks, Alan. So um, as Alan said, I'm an uh, internal medicine physician and cardiovascular epidemiologist. And most of my work is sort of at the cross-section between medicine and social science. So I focus a lot on the impact of social relationships on health. Um, I particularly study the impact of um, social isolation as one example um, on the health impact um, among uh, vulnerable populations. Um, I also focus on patient and family engagement and strategies to enhance engagement of family members in the care of adults with chronic illnesses. Dr. Corby Smith, would you like to take a few minutes and just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing most recently? Thanks so much, Alan. I'd be happy to. Um, my, um, my research over the last 15 years has been in and in partnership with communities, particularly in the eastern part of the state um, and in rural communities. I also serve as Associate Provost for Rural Initiatives at UNC. Um, and my research has really sought to understand and also leverage the expertise of community leaders um, and community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, um, to understand the issues of most importance to them and also to develop solutions that are relevant for their context and to um, uh, that have sustainability within those contexts because it draws on local expertise. Both of you are doing incredible work. Could you talk just briefly about how it translates to what's happening now with the pandemic and with coronavirus? Yeah, so um, actually Dr. Corby Smith and I work a lot together. <laughs> so that's um, the advantage of both of us being here together. Um, I think a lot of the work that we both do um, is related to health inequities more broadly and thinking about solutions um, and also not just solutions, but of what are the um, root causes and what are the structural issues that contribute to uh, health inequities. And so that is some of the work that we are doing together. Um, I have been focusing a lot uh, most recently on the impact of COVID on uh, social isolation. So as we know, you know, sort of a quarter to 3% of Americans are, are 
were isolated, socially isolated before uh, the COVID pandemic. And we, and that by isolation, I mean, they um, have a relative or an absolute lack of social network ties. And those can be ties to their family, friends or community or organizations that are of importance to them. And so um, since COVID and social distancing as a strategy to sort of mitigate COVID risk, um, the rates of social isolation and loneliness, which is one's perception of being isolated, skyrocketed. So a lot of the work that I have been focusing on um, since the pandemic began uh, are really trying to think about practical strategies that we can use to best support people who are isolated. We know that it's more common in older adults. Um, which is a population that a lot of my work also focuses on. And so we have been using um, in our clinic, I practice at the General Internal Medicine Clinic at the Ambulatory Care Center. And for example, we have been using our medical students um, to call and make weekly calls to check in on our patients who are at high risk for social isolation, um, not just to provide the sort of emotional support that they need, but also to identify and address their health-related social needs related to you know, food insecurity, housing, a lot of different social determinants. So we want to get as many questions from the media as we can. So uh, if we've got f folks in the media with questions, please just jump right in and, and ask away. There's really not a really organized way to do it. So go ahead and ask your questions. Hey, uh, I had a question, Brian Anderson here with the Associated Press. Thank you all for doing this, being accessible uh, and your help and, and giving us the medical expertise that we might not necessarily have here as reporters. Uh, but I wanted to ask about sort of the uptick in cases and the doubling rate. Uh, so we've seen in Alamance County, for example, over the last week, uh, maybe nearly a, a doubling of, of cases. What would be a concerning time frame for cases doubling? Are we looking at seven cases very troubling or seven days very troubling, 14 days very troubling? How concerned should we be at certain levels of cases doubling? So I, I am not actually sure what the absolute number is for the, the number of cases, the doubling rate that should be concerning. However, I think it's what's really important is to look at the trajectory and seeing how cases are changing over time. And if we look at the linear trajectory, we certainly have seen increased numbers of cases, um, certainly as the state has begun to open up. Um, as it were. So I think that should be really the concerning statistic. Um, and again, I can't speak to the actual, an absolute number of doubling. We could probably give you that information. There are experts at UNC um, who, who really track that number and who could tell you probably more precisely what that number is. But I do think it's important to look at the trajectory and what we're seeing is an upward trajectory. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would add that um, it's um, you know we're at we're at a stage now in terms of the sort of loosening of some of the sort of early pandemic um, restrictions um, that there's that what we're seeing is that this doubling or this increase in the cases is not necessarily a surprise, um, but it is concerning. And so we need to be thinking, particularly in places like Alamance County and some of our more rural communities, um, about how we address the pandemic now. So the contact tracing, making sure that we have testing in place, making sure that people who are being tested are being connected to medical care. Because what, you know, what that, what, what Crystal and I do around health inequalities, those inequalities have been there for, um, for as long as we've collected data on health and race and ethnicity. And what my concern is, um, is that as this pandemic sort of continues to evolve over time is that the chronic medical conditions that Crystal and I typically um, work on in our own research and in our clinical practices as general internists are, um, are not being addressed. The things that put people at high risk for morbidity and mortality like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses are issues that we need to actually be addressing now also. Um, and making sure people are in care so that um, so those issues don't become more burdensome as this pandemic continues to evolve. 
and I had a, a follow up sort of on um, the the disproportionate impact we're seeing. Uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen yesterday, uh, she said that it's at a statistic statistically significant level, even though there's still tremendous amounts of racial data that's that's not collected. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just wondering with schools saying they're going to higher ed schools saying they're going to reopen in certain places within the next two or three months. Uh, what can what should administrators or campuses or teachers be be sort of thinking about in order to make sure uh, that there's not further inequities as a result? I'm thinking of maybe minorities not having uh, as great of broadband access, for example. Uh, for in-person instruction. What are sort of some of these things that could be kept in mind to make sure that uh, racial inequality is not being furthered as a result of this? Yeah, uh, that's a fantastic question, Brian. Thank you for, for offering that. I think that it's a complicated issue, as you suggest. Um, we do have statewide reporting by race and ethnicity. However, um, what, we're, what we don't have is by consistent reporting by, um, by county in terms of race and ethnicity to understand the impact locally on the ground. Right now, the, you know, we've, we're moving to more sort of local efforts around mitigating the impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, and so we need to have those numbers to really understand the impact within local counties and communities. In terms of the response for um, uh, um, higher ed, I know that there are, uh, certainly at UNC and I imagine across the country, um, there's a lot of thought about how do we safely and efficiently and effectively reopen our, our, um, our, um, our, our higher ed for exactly some of the reasons that you've talked about. Um, uh, because even within higher ed, there are going to be disparities. People go home to their home communities and their ability to engage in, in um, the educational attainment and educational activities may then actually be um, uh, truncated as well. So there's, uh, UNC has um, a roadmap that they're, they're developing around um, how to do that effectively. I don't think this is the place really to, to have that conversation, but I'm, I'm happy to point you to that roadmap about how to make sure that we keep our students safe, our staff safe, and our faculty safe in this process of reopening. And I just wanted to add one piece related to the schools. Um, I think it's important to realize that the impact that all of this disruption, um, necessary disruption, I might add, is going to have on kids and as particularly um, students and, and children, um, school children of color, is probably not going to be seen until the end of this year. So I just hope that schools are very cognizant that even though the disruption started maybe towards the end of last semester, you know, in March or so, we're not going to see the effects of that for a while in terms of how it affects kids' education and their ability to progress um, the later grades. And so I hope that the schools are taking that lag into account and really being intentional um, about how we can best support kids' educational needs because I think there's also this convergence of have educational needs, but I think the mental health impact and the stress that this is causing on school kids is really something that I don't know that I've heard as much discussion about, um, but certainly, and it manifests very differently. We both, Giselle and I, take care of adults, so we know what, you know, this kinds of stress and anxiety and depression look like in adults, but I think um, for people who really have expertise in kids and young adults, thinking about what that looks like for them and how that manifests in um, various behaviors um, is going to be really important and, and not... Um, just thinking that because we're sort of out of the acute phase um, of the pandemic and kids are back to school um, and they're, you know, sort of catching up on the work from last semester that they're going to be okay to move forward because I think a lot of those kids were already disadvantaged and struggled and now this has added another huge stressor on top of sort of an already chronically stressed um, environment. And I think they're going to have to be a lot more uh, supports in place for kids. And we have to realize that this is going to be something that needs to continue probably even beyond the pandemic because the effects are multiplicative. Um, so I think that that's just another piece that we just have to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, I, I would I would just want to underscore what um, Dr. Sine is saying that this um, this we will not be the same after this pandemic. Um, the impact, the 
sort of individual and collective impact of this pandemic on our physical and emotional social health is going to be um, is is going to be long lasting um, and far beyond um, just the reopening of schools or the reopening the, of businesses. And um, what what I've been gratified um, to know the little that I know of what's happening at the state level is that there's an appreciation for that. Um, and I think that um, it, within healthcare, we're seeing, starting to see an appreciation of the need to have a long-term plan for how we're going to, um, to address the long-term impact of the pandemic um, beyond the acute COVID, potential COVID infection. Well, here's a question that was uh, sent through chat. So it's just kind of long, um, but uh, bear with me. <laughs> Why is there a lack of race or ethnicity numbers? And what's the explanation as you stand that, understand that on that lack of, of data? Um, the, the questioner says the contrast between Latino and black death rates is interesting. The, the numbers show that both blacks and Latinos have higher rates of illness, but blacks have a much higher death rate. Is that something that you could speak to? Yeah, I can take the first question. Um, I don't have a simple answer because it's not a simple issue. The um, the reporting of race, um, the reporting of rates by race and ethnicity are complicated by uh, several factors. Um, leaving the willingness to report race data by race and ethnicity aside, right? So I'm just going to leave that aside. Um, race and ethnicity are social constructs. So it's about how people identified and also how they're seen. Um, collecting those data are complicated. Um, and it's actually one of those debates that's within um, the um, within that health services research community that we all, all we already know that we in all healthcare settings, we have incomplete um, data on race and ethnicity. Um, in addition, in I would say, um, the, my, and this is my opinion, in the setting of a pandemic. Um, where there might be um, distrust of the medical system, um, uh, the testing might be happening in places where it's difficult to be able to collect those data. All of these things sort of could um, um, lead to in, incomplete data, um, and people might be less willing to report incomplete data. If you look at the state, even at the state level, the data that's there, um, there's still a good proportion of those that are um, incomplete. In addition, when in we're in our state, we are lucky to have, um, uh, I would say, lucky to have um, a, tri uh, a tribal community, several tribal communities, and there's often um, significant misclassification of um, American Indians in um, race ethnicity data. So my other worry, in addition to my concern about rural communities because we already know rural communities have less access to care. We've had multiple um, hospital closings in rural communities. The intersection of race and ethnicity, particularly for American Indian communities, I think is gonna be um, another area that we're gonna have to deal with long-term because of the misclassification. And often um, uh, tribal communities are situated in rural communities, which again, conflates and confounds the issue. And I think it, with respect to the part around um, the sort of seeming contradiction between for Latinos, I think there's um, what we know is that the case rate of Latinos being affected with COVID is high um, and it's potentially higher than for other groups. Um, but their death rate is lower. And actually, it's not um, lower across the board, but if we think about the proportion of Latinos in the US population is probably around, um, uh, the proportion that are dying is similar to their share in the population, which is around 18%. But there are um, a few states, um, New York, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Tennessee, where they're dying at disproportionately higher rates. Um, and so, but again, when we think about their cases, they're more likely to be diagnosed with COVID um, infections. And so I think part of the, a large driver of that, certainly in North Carolina, but I think it's true across the country, is that the median age um, for Latinos is um, much younger than it is the median age for, you know, blacks or whites in the country or in, in North Carolina. And so we know that age is a large driver of death um, rates from COVID. 
because people have accumulated more chronic illnesses and just the immune, immunologic response and the inflammatory response, you know, is um, more prominent as people age. So I think that it's really the age distribution um, and the, the things that sort of track with age, meaning they're less likely to have accumulated a lot of the chronic conditions um, that put them at higher risk for severe COVID infections and death. Um, but they're more likely to acquire the infection because in large part, um, well, for several reasons, but they, uh, Latinos are often living in multi-generational households. Um, so if one person in the family gets infected, it's very likely that many other people in the family um, will be able to acquire the infection. Similarly, they're often living um, in, you know, poverty and low income, in a low income situation pre-pandemic, and that has a lot to do with um, your susceptibility for, you know, your exposure to the virus. Um, and uh, also, they're more likely to work, and this is true in Afri of African Americans as well, but more likely to work in uh, front as frontline workers or in public facing um, jobs. And so again, that just increases their risk of exposure um, to the virus. I think sort of it's that confluence of um, factors that really help us to understand why we see this seeming contradiction between their um, rates of infection, but they're, you know, less, less likely to die from the infection. Uh, so do we have additional questions from the media, please? We've got a good group of folks on. Uh, any more questions from the media? Hi, this is Sarah Vasca um, with Cardinal and Pine. Thanks so much for um, you both making yourself available. Um, I wanted to ask a question about kind of also kind of piggybacking and talking about the, um, the, the rates of infection in the Latinx population. What are both of your impressions and kind of where the state is on contact tracers? And if um, given that this is a bilingual population, often only Spanish speaking, whether um, there's been, a, a, whether the need is being met in, in kind of securing enough um, Spanish speaking contact tracers in that community. Yeah, I, thank you so much for um, for that uh, question, Sarah. The um, it, this is a, a, a critical issue, um, as you raise the um, contact tracing. We're now in the stage where to be able to continue to address this pandemic, we need to make sure we need to know who's has who's infected and who they've come in contact with. So contact tracing is critically important. I know that there's been a huge push um, at the state level as well um, and um, in collaboration with several um, entities around the state to identify contract tracers. Um, the issues around language um, concordance is, is front and center around um, ensuring that we're able to reach people um, and to be able to communicate effectively. I don't have the data on um, on how many our uh, contact tracers are um, bilingual at this point. I think that that's a moving target. I know that that's a certain that's certainly an emphasis at the state level. Um, the recognition that um, we need to identify who has who's infected, um, ensure that they're being followed up, and also that the whoever they're in contact with is followed up as well. Uh, additional say, questions um, from the media. Oh, go, ahead. go right ahead. Uh, so hi, this is Jason DeBru in North Carolina. Oh, go, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, my, my question is unrelated to that one. So if you had yeah, something to add fine. on that. Um, all right, well, so my question is related to prison populations. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen uh, the, the judge's recent ruling, um, but I, I think it's probably clear that not enough has happened to protect inmates, uh, given especially that minority populations and especially black men are overrepresented uh, in prison populations. I wonder if you might comment a little bit about the concern of, of the spread of COVID-19 um, in prisons, in inmate populations, and then certainly even the higher risk of perhaps even a severe illness and, or even death um, among inmates due to COVID-19. Yeah, uh, this is a, this is a, a critical issue, um, and in any congregant setting, right? Any place where people are in a setting um, that um, that puts them in close con in close proximity to others, there's no way to have social distancing in prisons, in jails. There's just no way for that to happen, um, and so we've seen um, 
horrible, um, the, the, you know, the, uh, morbidity and mortality in, um, in prisons and jails. And just as you know, there's a disparity in terms of who's incarcerated um, and for how long and in what settings. The, um, and so this, this is a, a huge problem um, for um, uh, around health inequalities. I, you know, there, there are scholars, um, Laura Brinkley Rubenstein at UNC um, Chapel Hill is a, is a scholar in um, uh, people who are incarcerated and, um, and has done a lot of work in this area. And so I would want to make sure that you, um, you had the opportunity to talk with her. This is, um, this is the, you know, when we look at congregate settings, when we look at nursing homes, imprisoned populations, et cetera, et cetera this, is, this is huge. Um, and not only for the people that are imprisoned, but just as you note, those that are, that are working in those prisons. In fact, early on, some of the higher COVID positive um, rates were actually in people that worked in prisons. Um, and then it started spreading into the um, incarcerated populations. And I think, they, um, you know, it gets back more to a philosophical issue, but I think that it really begs the question of when we think about our action or inaction, um, how are you choose to consider it with respect to what strategies and what measures we take to protect um, people who are incarcerated, it goes back to value, right? And do we consider those lives valuable? Um, and I think that that's a, you know, sort of a fundamental philosophical question we have to ask ourselves. And I think um, if that's a question we have to ask of non-incarcerated populations as well when we think about everything else that's happening um, around our country um, uh, as it relates to interactions in, with um, black and brown people. Um, but again, if we think that those lives are valuable, then we will take extra efforts to protect them. And as Dr. Corby Smith said, the people who are working in prisons are predominantly also people of color. So to the extent that we think their lives are valuable, we also will take, um, will dictate the measures that we take to um, protect those individuals. But I think that we should certainly not forget at um, uh, how people get into prison and who quote unquote deserves to be there, that is not a foolproof system. We know that there is a lot of error in that system and there are people who are wrongly incarcerated and imprisoned and you know, should they also be at risk when they really shouldn't have been there in the first place. So I, I think that, that there are some practical things that we have to do around how we protect um, you know, that population and, you know, some places, for example, have been releasing um, nonviolent offenders and, and thinking about strategies so that we can mitigate the impact of the spread of the virus. Um, but I think it does need to be a larger con conversation and goes back to the issue of um, whose, whose lives we value and whose lives we think are dispensable. I, I'm not a scholar, a legal scholar, um, and um, there are others, as I mentioned, who have that expertise. I will say, though, that the decarceration of um, nonviolent offenders is certainly one of the things that have come up as a mitigation strategy in um, incarcerated populations. So we're almost out of time. Uh, any more questions from the media? There, there was one question in the chat box, I think, that um, might, might be the, one of the first questions. Oh, oh, you're right, actually. Hang on, let me get back to it. Okay, just talk amongst yourselves so I can get back to it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I've got it, Phil. Yep, there you go. It's been, it's been several months now that older folks have been restricted in their movement, and I'm wondering if there's a way forward for them to be more connected. Have you thought, folks thought about strategies, what that might look like? It speaks to the social isolation. Yeah, so I think that's something that I think about a lot, um, and I'm sure many of us do who have parents or grandparents or older adults that we care about and love. Um, it certainly has, you know, that is the highest risk group. Um, it's certainly taking a toll on them um, emotionally and um, in lots of other ways that impact their mental health. So I think that there are a few strategies that people are using um, 
and a lot of it is sort of phone based or video based and checking in with folks. I know, for example, Humana, um, uh, the insurance company, is providing a, they've partnered with an organization called Papa Incorporated, and it's <laughs> it's basically Papa has a program called Grandkids on Demand, um, and basically what they do is they use college age um, students to really call their um, their members, older adults, and really check in with them and figure out what needs they have and try to meet those needs. Um, and I, we had actually started something very similar as I alluded to in the beginning in our clinic, our own patients at UNC. Um, and I think that part of the strategy is really trying to figure out how can we keep them in contact with their natural network. So whether that's their family, their friends, their senior center, um, um, friends, whether it's their churches or synagogues, um, but really thinking about how can we best support them by checking in with them. Um, I will say that, you know, you all are probably familiar with North Carolina 211, where anyone can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and um, talk to someone live and tell them what your particular issue is that you would like addressed, and there are lots of uh, resources they can link you to, um, to address those needs. The, the outlets for social isolation and loneliness are very few within the 211 um, resource data bank. So that's what sort of in part led to us creating our own program where we use medical students um, to check in with our older populations and just to see what their needs are. And our students have been, you know, they'll take food to them if they need it, they'll figure out, um, Whatever the need is, and, and I will tell you that a lot of what we have discovered is that people are lonely. They don't have people to talk to. They're afraid to go out. Their family members are afraid to come and see them because you would feel awful if you exposed your mom or your grandma and they contracted the virus, which we know is going to be more deadly in those populations. So people really are cut off from their network. So I think just checking in with folks. I also think, you know, there's really a lot of... Um, need around teaching them how to use and, and become familiar and comfortable with using technology because of course that's probably the way that most of us are maintaining our connections is that we're getting on a zoom call or a webex or we're calling on the phone but for many older adults who've never had to access these types of techn technologies before that's very daunting and it's very scary and so i think the extent to which we can support them in that process it also helps keep them connected to their healthcare network which is obviously very important to dr corby smith and i as physicians when our patients we can't do video calls with them or we can't you know they're certainly not comfortable nor should they be probably come into the clinics yet um, for some of them who are really high risk you know how do we keep in touch with them how do we make sure their chronic medical needs get addressed um, and again, video is very helpful for us because at least we can see them and, and kind of get some clues. We can see their environment. We can, you know, have them and their camera or their laptop or whatever they may have around their house. We can look at safety issues. There's a lot of information that we can glean by doing video visits that we don't have as much with phone. But again, a lot of older adults um, are not, not, may not even have the technology or if they have it, they may not be comfortable with it. So I think that's to the extent that we can think about very creative programs um, as a way to help um, build up a skill set among our older adults and keep them connected, you know, with their, um, their community is really important. We, we're over time, but I want to see, we've got one more question I was hoping you might be able to answer um, that uh, Brian Anderson from AP is asking. Brian says, we've seen public health officials say the recent developments in data is concerning. Um, just how concerned should we be and how would you qualify the caseload, the sharp rise, steady increase or sizable uptick, if that's something that you can address? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think it, it would be dangerous to underestimate how much this infection, this pandemic is still raging on. Um, I think that um, we, um, while we're loosening the social distancing and um, other public health um, mitigation strategies, the personal mitigation strategies still need to be in place. Wearing masks, wa hand washing, um, getting tested um, and screened and tested if there, um, if there are any concerns. 
the contact tracing is critically important. That we are not out of the woods yet. Um, we have loosened some of the restrictions, but we are not out of the woods yet. Um, I, I am still concerned. In fact, just had a call where we were talking about, um, you know, what, when would our administrative staff be at, expected to come back um, for our center? And really, you know, right now, my, my message to my patients is um, that unless you have an acute problem that requires you to be seen, we need to be using telehealth. And we need to continue to expand our virtual and telehealth options, frankly, for our most at-risk patients, as, as Crystal um, just mentioned. These are, this is a critical component to ensuring that we're keeping people healthy and safe at the same time. Um, I, 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 um, we're not out of the woods yet, and we need to continue to, to, um, to, uh, to use these, uh, the strategies to keep ourselves and our families safe. I think uh, particularly, I totally agree with that. And I think a few things we can't, uh, you know, this is concerning. There is no question about it. And I think all public health experts and, um, you know, sort of modelers of this pandemic, we really will expect to see a second wave of this that may be very much worse um, than this first wave. And I think everyone is sort of waiting, you know, with bated breath, hanging our hats on the uh, a, a vaccine, um, which we all desperately hope we will get one and soon there are, you know, I think four or five trials that are ongoing right now that are in human, human, tri human phase of the trial testing. Um, but I also think we have to realize, right, that there are going to be many people and I think many the people who are most vulnerable to this who are not who are going to be very fearful of the vaccine, just like we see lots of people of color who are fearful of the flu vaccine. But certainly for this, where we know it's been developed quickly, you know, what happens if the uptake of vaccination is not very high? How can we, can we preemptively think about what we're going to do in that case? And what can we, can we help somehow um, mitigate the distrust um, among more vulnerable populations around the vaccine? And I also think that, you know, we're somewhat in a bubble here in the um, uh, triangle area uh, when we think about COVID, I mean, pretty much if I go out anywhere, um, you know, I see people wearing masks, people are very much appropriately social, socially distancing, and I, I feel um, for the most part protected. But I'm from Eastern North Carolina, so in my hometown of Sneeds Ferry in Onslow County, when I go home, you would not think we were in a pandemic at all. No one wears masks no one social distance. You don't see the markers necessarily on the floor that we see here. So I think that we have to be very much aware, that depending on where we are in the state, um, people do not have the same perspective. They're not necessarily following. They don't believe the science. They don't believe the death rate. Um, they think the whole thing is overblown. And where are those messages coming from? I mean, I don't know where they're coming from have some thoughts, but um, I think that we have to realize that there may be pockets where the outbreak is going to get even worse. I mean, it's going to get worse probably for all of us, but there are still going to be pockets where it's going to be worse. And I can tell you, I mean, when I'm, I'm home in Eastern North Carolina in Snape Ferry, you would not think we were in the midst of a pandemic at all. So I think we do have to also be cognizant and think about, you know, are there ways to help educate people what is the most what are the most effective strategies for helping people see the importance of this because you know we know that the rates of asymptomatic spread are very high so if you're in communities where there are lots of vulnerable people and for the most part the majority of the folks don't believe this they think it's a hoax or they're not going to pursue any of the strategies that are recommended for sure, there's going to be a disproportionate impact, um, which will we know will hurt people of color more, but it's going to be catastrophic for everyone. Um, and so I think that's just something to be cognizant of, uh, of that I, when I'm here, I, it's easy for me to forget, but when I drive, you know, three hours east of here, it's, it's quite apparent that we are in many ways not sharing the same experience or perceptions of, of this pandemic. 
Well, we have run way over, but I think it was well worth it. Um, so we are, we're about nine minutes over. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Again, we will provide via Dropbox um, and uh, YouTube the video files that you can use unedited. And then also if you uh, are interested in the audio file, we will get that to you. And thank you so much for joining us. And that uh, concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all. Thank you thank both. You.